Hey there, America. Welcome to the <clears throat> Bulwark. I'm JVL here with my uh, my my best friend, Tim Miller, and also a nice colleague, a guy I work with, Joe Perticone. I met him for the first time last week. It was great. We uh, met, no, we met in the spring. Did we? Did yes. we know? Ouch. Uh, All staff meetings. Ouch. This, is, this live stream is <laughs> off to a great start. So, uh, having a day, the thing we've said a lot over the last seven years, but here we are again. One of the hallmarks of the Trump era is that things can be simultaneously shocking and also entirely predictable. And here we are for the first time in American <clears throat> history, a Speaker of the House of Representatives has been ousted from his post because of what, like a dozen weirdos. Uh, it's amazing. Because There's a lot a to chew over. I think. I think that's pretty much what oh. was the. I mean, I think that's pretty much the reason. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that, I mean, really? there, I, there was not any substantive reason, really. I mean, Matt Gates kind of made up some, but I think because right. he's kind of an unlikable douche is pretty much why. Wait, which one, Gates or Kevin? Or well, both. Like Kevin? But in this case, I think that was kind of the reason why Kevin is out. Right? People didn't like him. Well, I don't know. So let's, let's go to again. Lots of ground to cover. <clears throat> uh, I right now we just had moments ago. In fact, I think it's probably still ongoing while we're sitting down here. Kevin McCarthy putting out a statement. Uh, so let's go in reverse cron order. Joe, can you quickly catch us up on what did McCarthy just say? Is he resigning his seat in Congress? Is he going to run again for speaker? Is he going to be tricky dick with, uh, you know, I you won't have old Kevbo to kick around anymore and then going to go away and wait for people to call him in a panic because they can't find another speaker? What, what is he saying at this? So very moment? he said that he's not going to seek another run as speaker, which was shocking because Immediately after we all exited the chamber today, a lot of the Republicans like Ralph Norman was like, oh, Kevin's going to run again. Like they all thought he was going to. And I was like, oh, I bet he will. And then he just said, no, like this sucks. Why am I going to do this? Was it like the full denial? What, what, what is Tim? What was the term of art in Republican circles? Like the, the full patent or something? Right. You know, I, I, I will not run. Sherman esque. Sherman esque. Sherman. Yeah. Was, did you do that or was it the, the lawyerly? I will not seek. He said, I will not seek, but then he addressed questions regarding like, what if he's nominated? And he says, I've got guys that will, will like support me and always support me. And he's like, but I think like it's time to move on. He didn't say whether or not he'll stay in Congress. And so it's unclear what he's going to do in Congress. It's not like he's on committees or anything, but it's also not like he can be that kind of you know, mentoring figure that Nancy Pelosi is because he was only on the job eight months and he didn't accomplish very much during it. And also mm -hmm. nobody respects him. Not mm -hmm. according to Kevin. I don't I don't know if you've heard, if you were listening that closely to his press conference there, Joe, but he he had a historic speakership. I mean they they accomplished a lot, he said. It's true. It's been a here's long the, time since somebody had to get 17 votes before they won the job, right? Here's the gas stoves bill. There was tons yeah. of stuff. Mm. Wow. Uh, so let's go back. Let's let's wind the clock back. Uh, when this whole shambolic thing started, I think a lot of us kind of flippantly said, uh, well, <clears throat> let's see if he can make it to Christmas. And I'm not sure how much we really meant it, but uh, like we should have meant it. Like, it's amazing. He didn't make it to Halloween even. Um, it uh, entirely predictable, right? Because it's a caucus which has, you know, too too small a majority, too many members who are cranks, and too many voters who are there for the crankitude, right? Because this is the, like, do we think that the people who made this happen are going to pay any electoral price from it from their from their vote? No, they're going to have electoral gain, right? Gain, yeah, yeah. And, and with among Republican electorate among you know, cachet in, in MAGA media world. And I'm sure it's the same more mainstream Brett Baer media types, you know, the types of conservative media that were trying to foist Ron DeSantis on the Republican electorate. They will, you know, tisk tisk Matt Gates, you know, and wag their finger at him. But but that is not what things are going to be like on Bannon's War Room, on Newsmax. And I, I follow all these weirdos. They're all are, all cheering him. So I, no, I don't, I don't think that they'll suffer anything. And I look, as far as the predictability, when we did our, I don't remember if it was a podcast or emergency live stream, you know, I think it was the, another one of these uh, when he had the 14 votes. You know, what I brought up then was I think that they'll give him one. 
right? Like he will be able, they'll give him a leash of one deal that he'll be able to cut with the Democrats. He used up his, his deal with the Democrats on the debt ceiling. And then they came up through the, um, you know, the government shutdown fight here, which, which it should, didn't have to be a fight. He, he could have resolved this during the, the debt ceiling deal, but he, he kind of backtracked on that. Um, and so he had to cut another deal with Democrats, no matter how much he tried to spend it on the Sunday shows as the Democrats trying to stop him or whatever. He More Democrats voted for it than Republicans. He needed Democrats to get it passed. And so... You know, he, now he found himself here and we found himself exactly in the place that I that I said, you know, nine months ago that he couldn't do that. Eventually, if you cut deals with Democrats, these guys are going to come for your scalp. Now, I, I, I wasn't as prescient this week because it just felt like since they there was no momentum for another person. You know, it was hard to really have confidence to predict that Matt Gates was literally going to go Joker mode and just be like, I have no plan. I, I don't even know if Democrats will go along with this. I have no alternative, and I'm just going to try to come for your scalp, and that it would work. I I, I didn't really expect that um, when he, when he cut the deal last week. Um, you know, in the in the micro, but in the macro, I think this was very predictable. I was pretty shocked because this shutdown fight, like it's not like they solved the problem. I would have thought that if he had passed an omnibus, which is like where they clump all the spending bills together and do it all at once, that would have been the thing that makes them do this. But they just did it over like a a 45 day continuing resolution, which means like the new speaker has to do this again, immediately, like first day on the job, he's going to have to do this. And so it's like, are they going to do this again? Are they just going to keep kicking people out? And it's like, at what point, like, I don't know if there's a solution because there's, it's not like they're going to, someone would have to reach a deal with Democrats from the onset. And so the Democrats that I spoke to a lot today, their point was that the time to make a deal with McCarthy or for McCarthy to reach out and make a deal with Democrats to save him was not this weekend. It was in January when he needed support. And instead of getting support from people who could like bring more to the table and keep him alive, he gave away the store to the Freedom Caucus, which allowed them to do this. Like he lowered the threshold so that it could be just Matt Gates. It used to be several members. And then the deal was maybe we'll lower it to five. And they said, no, we want one. And so all it took was Matt Gates going Joker mode. And another point that a lot of Democrats made is that because it was McCarthy. So like Patrick McHenry, who's now the speaker pro tem, he doesn't have that bad blood with Democrats the way that McCarthy does. They view the way he treated uh, the January 6th committee, the way he constantly undermined the process, um, the way he responded after January 6th was a major selling point. They view this as he was rotten from the start and he had no interest in working with them in any capacity. And even on the debt deal, when he had to, that was one isolated moment in a very long history predating his speakership of bad behavior and bad faith acts by Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, there are two just really, I just want to hit both of these points because they're just so critical. And so just cut there and they're separate that you made. One is just the forward looking, it, uh, you know, the, Really, how do you pick a speaker, right? That, that with that forty-three day anvil hanging over their head, you know, how do you pick somebody that is willing to keep the government open and and could come up with a deal that dem- that the Senate would pass? It's kind of impossible. So, like the only thing I can just think of, we're just spitballing here, is is that they put forth a speaker that basically promises to shut the government down, right? Maybe maybe that maybe a speaker that promises to shut the government down in forty-three days could get two hundred eighteen Republican votes. I I don't know, but then you then you run into the Lawlers to the do the more moderate Republicans finally get some balls in that case? I, I I don't know. So that so we can talk more about that, but I just think that that is a key. Go ahead. Do you have one? I mean, thought? I'm I'm not of the belief that like Lawler and Co are the moderates they claim to be. Yeah. So maybe throughout this can... whole throughout this whole year, their like desire to be bipartisan has not been to be bipartisan. It's to dangle the threat of bipartisanship if they don't get their way. They say to their fellow Republicans, don't make me go be bipartisan. Don't make me, you're going to push me. Like what an amazing party. Like that's, that's the whole moderate lane. I say like someone like Brian Fitzpatrick, he was like trying to work with problem solvers because he's co-chair of the problem solvers. You saw today that like 
because the problem solver Democrats didn't leap forward to defend Kevin McCarthy, you now are seeing Republican problem solvers trying to ditch the problem solvers caucus. And they're saying, um, how dare you didn't come to our defense? And so I think you're actually going to see a hardening among these moderates as opposed to them. There you go. So that, I, I think that this, so just, again, just spitballing, I don't have, I, on this first part, I don't have inside sources, but it seems to me like that somebody that, that basically is going to be more hard nosed about a shutdown in 43 days is likely to be a person that could, could win the 218 Republican votes. Okay. Now, just really quick on the Democrats, because you made some good points there that I do not want to pass over, because this has been much of the discussion today. And this morning, when I woke up, even still, there was a lot of talk, you know, among the reporters on the Hill, Joe, you and, and sources, I, I, people weren't sure whether like there would be a group of Democrats that would say, okay, let's dance with the devil we know here, right? And, um, and I, there turned out to be none. And I was pretty impressed and surprised by how vociferous they are. And if you see these quotes, I mean, you know, you expect it from Jayapal, who's out there. So it's like, basically, I want to let them wallow in their own pigsty. Okay, but like even more normal members, you know, were out there saying this. I was texting with some moderate members today. And, and basically, without, we were not, you know, without betraying trust, like they, they, their basic message was the old James Carville line, which is when your opponent is drowning, throw him an anvil. Like that was basically what they were saying to me. And and like they like there was no oh I, I couldn't find anybody on the, I don't know, you were you were in there. So it didn't seem like there are any Democrats that were even entertaining this. And that goes back for me to his original sin, which is the January 6th, the, the house gets stormed, McCarthy goes back in there and whips votes for the overturn. And then he screws with the January 6th committee, which you mentioned, Joe. And so to me, it's like. He got the speakership because he made this deal with the devil, with Trump and the MAGA Trumpers. There was like, if you give me the speakership, you know, I'll do what it is take the I will do what is needed to get it. And and from that day, he had no chance of ever getting bailed out for the Democrats. Because why would the Democrats ever bail out somebody that went along with the coup? And that is what is so galling about even about the norm, the quasi-normal Republicans on cable today. Now I am being like, put me on cable. I want to fight with. Carlos Curbelo and these assholes and like who wanted to be like you know we do have to worry about the institution we do have to worry about norms no the institution is fine Kev, the institution with problems is the Republican Party it's rotten Kevin McCarthy had to make a deal with a rotten institution in order to get his speakership and that is why he's out on his ass like the, yeah. the institution of the house it, it has no issues yeah. Nancy Pelosi didn't deal with this the, uh, the older no. you know what I mean like the progressives were always going to oppose McCarthy but like the institutionalists and the moderates and like all these longtime members, everyone was going to oppose him on the Democrat side because they viewed it as a moral imperative because of his well-documented behavior. And that doesn't exist with some of these other guys floating around like yeah, McHenry or whatever. Like McHenry. But McHenry just now we're finding out his first act as speaker pro tem is he has ordered Nancy Pelosi to vacate her hideaway office. So as former speaker, she has this little tiny little office of her own in the Capitol complex, as opposed to in her house office building that's adjoining the Capitol. And his first act is to kick her out because that's what they want. They want blood. Please vacate the space tomorrow. The room will be rekeyed. This is a classy bunch. This is a classy is bunch. Amazing. They've been humiliated today, and their big shot is to go after well, Nancy Pelosi while she's visiting her friend's right, funeral. Wanna, That's great. I want to... We're going to do a lot of sort of uh, perspective shifting here. The first thing I want to do now is, is look forward. So the House can't do any business until we have a speaker, or no? How does this work, Joe? So technically, like, Patrick McHenry's the speaker, but, like, he's not. So he's not in, like, the line of succession of the president. Right. So slight positive. Patty Murray. Um, boom. Yeah. So the real, so something right. really Straightforward from here. Patty Murray's. Patty president. Murray. Um, so there's, there's all these things they can't do. And instead of like getting right to this right away, cause they just don't want to, they're going to have a candidate forum, assuming it'll be closed door, obviously uh, on Tuesday where they'll say who should be this, who should. Today is Tuesday. So in a week. Yes, we, they're taking a week off. And then Wednesday is when they'll have the first vote to nominate and go through this whole process that we did in January that's even less. Right, so who so who has the leverage here? 
is the leverage does it sit with the person who wants to become speaker uh because they the party needs them the party needs somebody to take this terrible job which is itself like a, a bolito from the counselor or uh does does the party have leverage over you know we can we can bestow this thing over this is why I can't, I can't quite tell who has to start making concessions here is it the the guy or girl who wants to be speaker has to say yes i'll do this yes i'll do that or can they just sit there and say you know what i could take or leave the job i don't give a crap uh you know, well, that's how Paul Ryan got the job, right? right? Paul Ryan got the job right. basically by putting himself in that situation. Uh, I, like you guys fight over it, then foist it upon me. Who's in that position now? Something way crazier than Paul Ryan. About maybe Jim Jordan is in that position right now. Um, I don't know. Um, as the person that's like, I, I, you know, I'll accept it if you just give me everything I want. Um, but, and then you get down into the shutdown pile, and then I think that gets into the other question you want to get into JVL. Which but I is think like, the shutdown has to be has to be part and parcel with this, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if if you were the person negotiating to become the speaker, the shutdown vote has to be part of that negotiation, right? You can't take the job and then say we'll deal with it. Yeah, I guess my other question is: so since Pat, who controls the floor? Right, Joe. And so this is where you get we, we are getting into fantasy politics, which we try to avoid here at the Bulwark, but like. We're in unprecedented, uncharted water. So why wouldn't we be in unprecedented situation? Like, might the move in this 43 days be for the Democrats? And uh, there's nobody left. I don't know. Brian Fitzpatrick, you know, to make Brian Fitzpatrick the speaker. And and as part of some broader grand bargain that includes, you know, funding Ukraine, funding the government through the end of the year, and then you assume Fitzpatrick gets thrown out. But who would want to do that? You're you're so, like, you're, put, you're making yourself just a, a a complete you know you're a dead man walking. Then if you're the Republican that agrees to that, but any idea speaker. of a moderate speaker or unity speaker is usually fan fiction. But I think in the event where it becomes real, is you would have to be paired with a rule change because someone's going to have to say, we need to immediately pass a new rule saying that it's, you can't do this. One guy screws up everything for us. And a lot of them are rethinking that concession right now, because this happened because McCarthy let it happen. He said, you have the power to do this. And they went and did it. And so if there's any new speaker that's going to come along, like if a, freedom caucuser or like a Jim Jordan tries to become speaker, well, then he'll, you know, he could be that pro shutdown speaker. But if they want to bring someone on the other end of the spectrum, then it's going to have to be someone that, you know, campaigns on changing that rule. And because Democrats will vote to change that rule right away. So uh, like the natural person is Scalise. Just really right. quick. And, and and that's that's the name that they're being put forth, right? He's the whip. He is, you know, I, part of it is like, in what way is he different than Kevin? You know, I, I guess he's, he's not, not as, as hate, dumb. He's not as, hate, he's not as dumb. He's not as hated because he's not just this blow-dried phony, right? And he's been shot. So he has some sympathy, you know, rightfully. There's some sympathy elements to him, right? But on the other side of this, like he's been with Kevin and cut all these deals with Kevin. So I don't know why the Gates crowd would like him any better. And and it's not like the Democrats are going to see Scalise as, uh, you know, a, a somebody that they would change their mind on. He's, again, in the same way that, you know, all the, all the MAGA people wouldn't like wouldn't like him any better than Kevin. Uh, like, why would the well, Democrats like him the any MAGA better than Kevin? People, he did all the same as, thing as Kevin did. He, 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 as he you said, though, election. Tim, the, their, their beef with Kevin was just like, he's a douche, we don't like him. Right. And they got him. And so I wonder if this frees them up to, to just declare victory. Right, yeah. if you're the Matt Gates and those guys. Say, Scalise is a more conservative, you know, right, whatever. fighter. Yeah. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Scalise is fine. Yeah, that might yeah. be it. And get well. And Gates didn't call out Scalise the way he did some of the other deputies um, during the whole round of speeches before the vote today. He was he went after Garrett Graves. He went after like Emmer. And he didn't really hit Scalise because Scalise has sort of been on the sidelines through a lot of this stuff. Um, Isn't he also um, sick? Yeah, he's very, he was recently diagnosed with blood cancer. Um, And so he, like, he was wearing a very um, heavy duty mask on the floor because 
you know, that's the guidance for when you're very ill and in a crowded space. And so, oh, he's going to listen to Fauci. Uh, so, so we're going to have a mask wearing guy with blood cancer leading a conference that but is Joe so Biden's unwieldy. Too old to be and and the conference is so unwieldy that Tim, I'm sorry. Can do, I just I guess I, there, maybe this works and for a little while, but there seems to be the same problems. I just want to rant about Garrett Grace since you mentioned his name really quick. I have to. He's my Baton Rouge congressman up the road. Did you watch his speech today, nominating Kevin or supporting Kevin? Right he starts him. ranting about Matt Gates. I mean, he went off on Matt Gates, and he's just like he's a grifter, and I'm getting text messages. You won't believe this. Matt Gates is text messaging this about this, and he's like, "What do you want? You want crackheads? Do you want crackheads running the Congress?" And you know, Gates is like, you know, Garrett Graves is like, "We need a serious guy like Kevin." I'm just watching this going, man. If you just saved like 10% of this energy for being mad at the guy that sent a mob into your office like two years ago, like you really wouldn't be in this spot. Okay. Like it really, um, I just, it, I hate to be Rudy in 9 11 here, but it all comes back to this for me. Like they would, they would have a 10 or 15 seat majority. And like, you know, if they all just done the right thing that afternoon, so where does but he instead go? he's like, Matt Gates is a grifter. And you support Donald all Trump right. for president? Matt Gates is a grifter. So where okay. does Trump go on this, right? So Trump is, my Kevin belongs. Maybe for Trump. speaker. Trump Several people been... have suggested him. Sitting congressmen yeah. have suggested him. Well, but uh, so so Trump uh, Trump World reportedly was very cross that uh, Mike Kevin had not formally endorsed him for president, and uh, so what do they do? Do they take a victory lap here? Do they do they just stay hands off? What what are your thoughts on that? So Trump posted on Truth Social this like very weak, you know, why are Republicans always fighting with each other instead of fighting Democrats today? And that was like the most minimal thing he could possibly do. He could have Donald Trump this saying, bud. "Why are Republicans always fighting yeah. with other Republicans?" But like he, he could have he could have nipped this in the bud long time ago. Like he has so much more control and sway over these very hard right members than anyone on the planet. And he could have stopped this, and he didn't. He left Kevin out to hang out to dry, the way he has done with every single human being who's ever done anything nice for him. This was the the most expected outcome is him just being like, yeah, like whatever, like go get him. <laughs> well, Texas 22 representative Troy Nels. I don't know if you've ever Googled him. Take a look at that guy. He's really cigar smart. Adams. Um, he is. He said he's going to nominate Trump for speaker. And, and I, I don't I don't I didn't have the other names. I was just was, they're going through my feed as we got on. But I, I saw at least two other members suggest him. Um, so. You know, I mean, that's more votes than a lot of people are going to have. Uh, he would speaker. be a, a great speaker. Many people are saying yeah. he would be possibly the best speaker in mm-hmm. history because he would make the best deals. Oh, he Laura would just Loomer walk thinks Congress. he should be speaker. He would just, you know, he would sit down in five minutes. They'd have all the best deals. Yeah, uh, Chris Hayes, uh, nothing I mean, nothing would own me more than making Donald Trump speaker. I think that's right. You can just he own the libs. He couldn't be speaker. You have like a schedule. You have to like, you have to do things yourself. You can't just, Oh, you have to do things. You can't can't farm it out to AIDS. Um, Here we go. We've also got this. This is going to be such a shit show. I just, I think it's hard for people to appreciate just how if they can, uh, this Tuesday thing that you bring up, Joe, I think is really important. Like the two points you brought up is that if if they're really going to stall this a week and if they're really going to have that 40 day anvil over their head, I, that create that creates so much time for troublemaking. Like here's Anna Paulina Luna saying on Tuesday that she'd only back a new House Speaker who would bring up a vote on impeaching President Biden. She wasn't even one of the eight who opposed it. Like this is just another crazy person out of Florida. Um, and so you know, JVL, I think you were you were so good on those newsletters back during Kevin's first set of troubles, where you were like. Part of the reason why Kevin's got this is just the inertia of it. Like it's hard to organize against somebody. Like if you can't beat somebody with nobody over time, they I think they probably might have been able to jam Scalise through tonight, right? Like in the same way they jammed Kevin possibly. through. Might have taken a few yeah. votes, possibly, right? Possibly, but it's just like maybe you don't think so, Joe? I just <sighs> think in a week, like think about all the demands that v- these various lunatics are going to have. I think it's going to be very hard to to you know corral do they amnesty the guys who just blew up my kevin i mean do those do those guys get to do this for free there's been some talk of having a vote to expel matt gates yeah i don't i don't put a lot of stock in the 
buzz about expelling Matt Gates because members don't like to create precedent that could hurt them. Um, and what we just saw today was the culmination of McCarthy creating a precedent that could kill him. And so I don't, I don't, I couldn't see them doing like an expulsion. I only uh, until an ethics report is like formalized and it's like somewhat bad, then they could do it. And would they, I don't know. Heaven was so bitter at Gates. He was so like, he, he was so petty. Oh, in that yeah, government. Was- the other name up here that I just want to shoot down for, for people watching this who are going to see buzz over the next week, Tom Emmer, who runs the NRCC. People keep throwing his name out there. The, Tom Emmer is just like Kevin McCarthy with less charisma. Okay, like the I, like the, they, they, they continue to have this fantasy politics where like we're gonna we're gonna bring back a normal Republican who's who can just manage the process. The, none of these eight weirdos who just voted to overturn well seven weirdos and and Nancy Mace who's just like on total YOLO mode. She's just like uh, like she just is living for chaos. I think I don't know what's happening with her, but um, but there none of those but besides Mace and the other seven are going to go for Emmer, and neither is Bobert or or MTG or the others who did right. So it has to be somebody crazier than Kevin. Like, like that that's just baseline. It has to be somebody. Emmer, Emmer get less votes because a lot of them view him as um one of the chief negotiators on the debt deal. And that's like the original sin. And that's why I think someone like Scalise, even though he has current issues, like he has an upper hand there. Jim Jordan, I don't know. I really don't know. Olivia Beavers is crushing this beat, by the way. Shout out to you, Olivia. Cheers. She's not she's nailed two House Republicans crying. She's seen crying. I'm I'm just taking a little sip of that. So uh good. I hope you enjoy that, Tim. Let me let me bring the room down a little bit. Oh. Donald Trump is gonna pay zero political price for this. Do you think a week from now, like voters, this is going to show up in hypothetical Trump Biden matchup polling with people will be like, boy, that Republican Party doesn't seem like they're so good at governing. Maybe we shouldn't hand control the government back to them in a year and, and one month. Because I, I don't think, think so. No, 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 look, no one's going to be like, I'm changing my mind about the Republicans because Kevin McCarthy, you know, uh, speaker chaos. But I do think that this contributes to a view of the Republican Party that they are run by crazy people, they're ungovernable, that they're, you know, conspiracy laden. And, and, but Rui Teixeira that... tells me that it's the Democrats who are run by extremists and they've really, like, I don't understand. I don't I know, understand. I know. Well, some people are going to keep thinking that. Some people are, are going to keep thinking that and that's going to, that's a separate issue. But um, I, I think that it's very plain that the Republicans are run by crazy people. And, and you're always out there being like, well, we don't always, nobody ever cares. Nobody gets cared. People get credit. But this is the reason why the Democrats still run the Senate. This is the reason why Kevin McCarthy only has a five seat majority, because there was a, 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 a certain percentage of people that said no to Joe Kent and like, uh, you know, a handful of other lunatics that that lost house races last time um and and that is the reason why kevin's margin is so small so i do think it will matter it's not going to show up like you want in the polls but it, I, I do think that it, it contributes to something that's hurting the party's image now sarah longwell our colleague my best friend is going to conduct a focus group of republican voters in swing states mm-hmm. and they are going to blame democrats nancy oh, pelosi sure. and joe biden for this thing that's, for sure. That's and they're going to go ahead. and say, and this is why you tease something on threads. And I want to hear, I want to hear your take on this, because this is, this is a true thing that's going to happen. The Wall Street Journal, Republican types. Oh, yeah. They are all going to go out Let's there. Do and, this. Yeah, they're all going to go out now and they're going to say, this is the Democrats fault. All right. And, and that we gave, we, we tried. We tried, you know, we gave them a speaker that was willing to cut a deal. He didn't, he didn't default on our debt. You know, he's not grabbing any hog at, at Beetlejuice the musical you know he's just a regular guy and we tried to give you a regular guy but but you all voted him out plus eight republicans you all voted him out and and you know had had you saved him then maybe we would have could, could have you know had nice things and held hands and sung kumbaya but since you didn't now your punishment is going to be you know we're going to make bane our next the next speaker of the house and and we have and to it's going to be your Trump. fault and we have and, to vote for know, Trump. Yeah, I'm no sorry, choice. but we have to vote for Trump. They are going to they are the, going to say that they are going to say that. And some people will be convinced by that. But I like I, I can't control that. Six percent of the country will be convinced. And that's enough. 
so this is so why you think Democrats should have saved him. That's what I want to go back well, to. You teased this. I, you thought that so Democrats is, should have saved Kevin, which I totally reject. So I have, well, this is, I don't really think that. I don't know what I think on this. This is one of the reasons I wanted to do the show with you guys. I wanted to ask you. I want to separate this into two questions. I want to separate into the sort of good government question and then the political question. Uh, I mean, the truth is, and I've written this, McCarthy who has been a better speaker than we expected him to be. He, he basically held the line on the Ukraine stuff. It is a low bar, but it's a real bar. And I, I think his speakership turned out better than I had hoped uh, that it, it might. Um, he did cut a deal on the debt ceiling. They did get to a continuing resolution. Uh, he did talk about supporting Ukraine as if it was an important part of the national interest. Like this is, these are three of the, the most important things that he could have done over the course of the last seven months or however long it was. Uh, and, and that's. He and also he opened up a baseless Trump. impeachment inquiry. inquiry. To- of course. And, but yeah. that was, I mean, we all assumed that, right. We all assumed sure. that that was coming and, uh, so the, the combination of him having been a better speaker uh, than we, we had feared he might be with what is this chaos going to look like in this interregnum? Uh, because who knows? I mean, we're all saying like, oh, yeah, they could consolidate by next week. And that's totally possible. It's possible that by Tuesday we'll have a new speaker. It's also possible we won't. Right. I mean, things could devolve and get worse. Uh, and also then it's possible that the next speaker is going to be really much more irresponsible than than my Kevin was. And so from a good government perspective, I think that maybe Democrats should have bailed him out. I'm going to ask you both about that. The other side of this, the political question is, so, you know, the, the when someone's drowning, your opponent is drowning, throw them an anvil. Wouldn't the real anvil being be having the support of Democrats? Right. This is I mean, in, in a weird way, like from the, the in the mind of the Republican, nothing is more compromised than a Republican who cut the deal with Democrats. And so I, I wonder yeah. if actually it would have created more chaos within the Republican conference to then start having the Republicans draw lines between sort, you know, supporting other Republicans who work with Democrats versus uh, Republicans who won't. So I don't know. We, I put this to you guys and uh, yeah. you guys in the comments down YouTube can fight about this too, but uh, I want to hear Joe. So my short, uh, I'll, uh, my short answer on this is on the good governance side. I, I just, I think that this is a fair thing to consider. Kevin will almost certainly be a better, better at good governance than whoever replaces him, unless we get such a shit show that we end up with the, you know, bipartisan uh, uh, speakership, which I, which is non-zero. I, I don't I don't think it's 10 percent, but I, I think it's non-zero. So, you know, who knows? I think that, you know, that you have to throw that in the hopper. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I think he'll be better. I, you know, he said I got a text that he he um, did say during his remarks, his farewell remarks. You know, he's like compared Putin to Hitler and like he sees Putin as bad and thinks Putin is bad and thinks we should fund him. And that puts him in like the top 30% of the party, right? Probably top 30% of the party right now. Hey, that's cool. Thank you, Sebastian. That's a cool effect. Um, I did not do that. Did Sebastian do that for me? I don't or know. Is that's it, amazing. Does, Zoom does do that, that happen if I do that? Now? Why don't I get that? Hey. Oh, that's strange. Okay. Well, that's fun. YouTube. Um, hi out there. Uh, so that's true. Person's going to be worse. But for me, this goes back to the anvil is that the, the, the American people need to see the real face of the Republican Party. And, and I, I just think that that's the best way for Democrats to win. Democrats are not going to win this election. I know this is to your chagrin, JVL, based on an assessment of the voters' feelings about Joe Biden's handling of the economy. Like, they're not. They're going to win this election if it's based on a choice between a imperfect but basically competent normal party, you know, with a few extreme people over here on the fringes versus a bunch of lunatics who like might want to turn us into a game show host dictatorship. Like, and that's the best, that's the best frame for them is that choice. And so the Republicans having Jim Jordan and his like little, you know, pedophilia, Jim, you know, ring kind of vibe going like that that is that is a better face and that goes back to me to a long-standing and i think legitimate debate i've had with with people going back to 2016 about would it have been better for donald trump to have Corey <laughs> lewandowski as his chief of staff than john kelly i think so 
I think I, I think so. I think it would have there would have been a little more pain on the front end, but but it would have been better politically. But I, I don't I don't think it's a clear question. I don't know, man. Tim, I'm not sure what in our history together makes you think that the American people, the great and good American people, seeing the true face of the Republican Party is going to make them tap out. The, the Arizona they, election. They, we the had Ari- an insurrection and Trump is polling like a point and a half better yeah, than okay. Joe Biden. I know, right but Arizona, the Arizona and Georgia midterm election is my answer to yes. the question. So Fair I'll enough. kind of agree with Tim on that in that like, at least from a Congress level, electorally, the presidency is a way different issue. But on a Congress level, Congress is won or lost in these like very, very purple districts like Marie Glusenkamp Perez beating Joe Kent, uh, a very January 6th lover, Trump lover, real nut. She beat him because people in those districts look at that and go, that's terrible. And then they will vote, though, for Republicans like in Mike Lawler's district where they go, oh, here's this nice man who says I would like to accomplish things that aren't that crazy. People see that on a really local level. And so as many Matt Gates as there are in Congress, the the balance of power is one actually in those purple districts. The presidency is a whole other issue. And that's why like Trump can be neck and neck with Biden, while at the same time, these congressional races can be totally one-sided as long as one person in the race is not crazy um, in these purple districts. And so that's kind of where I fall on that in terms of whether so, or not- Joe, just to be clear, are you, are you saying you think that this will hurt yeah. a handful of Republicans this running for real election? behavior and government shutdowns and all of this behavior has its biggest impact in these purple districts. And we see it time and time again. And when you see it like at the, at the presidency level, when you nominate someone like Donald Trump, like it's a crapshoot. But like at the statewide level, it really depends on the state. Like in Arizona, they said, I don't want Blake Masters. And so they choose someone like Mark Kelly. So it really depends on the state. But at the congressional level, where it's mostly like, your community, like your county and maybe the county over, you know, it's a lot easier to discern crazy from not crazy. Um, And then in terms of like keeping McCarthy or or like Democrats reaching out to keep McCarthy out of good governance, it depends where you fall on this issue. And it's clear that Democrats were on the side of it's a moral imperative to get rid of him because of what he has done There is no reason to trust him at all going forward. He, the way he undermined everything they did as minority leader and then coming in as speaker, they viewed it as it doesn't matter what the next person does. It is a moral objective to get him out of this role because he is unfit for the role. And so that's, that's you know, how I, I'm, I'm seeing the logic. There. Joe is so cute with his California background. Quick aside about how Congress seats are like two counties over. It's like in sure. Iowa. And in Iowa, it's like 60 counties as a congressional yeah. seat. But anyway, I, well, I, the, I digress. The district I grew up so, in starts at the Golden Gate Bridge and ends at the Oregon border. So, but it's like very true. skinny and it goes all the way up the coast. So this is, a, you know, an interesting historical aside. Kevin McCarthy was denied the speakership the first time he tried for it for explicitly these reasons, that the people inside the caucus thought he is not smart enough to do this job, right? Do you remember this? It was a big, it was, yeah. it was you know, a tremendous, uh, you know, like having his epaulets ripped off and told he'll never eat his lunch. In he went on again. TV and he said the quiet part out loud. He said that our Benghazi oversight hearings are about hurting Hillary Clinton, not about right. figuring out what happened in Benghazi, which like, OK, everybody, which now is like kind of not saying that is the problem in the Republican. Party. Right. It's like baseline that they're doing oversight just to hurt Democrats like that. That's, you know, so, so what he again, said, it's then, one of these things were not surprising. Right. This guy who the party flinched from giving the speakership to because they thought he wasn't smart enough. Like, he just won't take no for an answer. He goes through 14 humiliating votes to get it. And then, like, he winds up the first speaker out. It's like, who could possibly have seen this coming? Right? This is the... the... Oh, I thought where you were going with this is it, it's a nice encapsulation of the disintegration of the Republican Party. Because it really is. Right? It's like we couldn't let you yeah. be speaker because you were being too on the nose about how we were politicizing investigations. And now it's like, okay, we let you be speaker. And now 
we can't let you be speaker because you are not like shameless enough. In, in yeah, your you're too bipartisan. Yeah, you're too right, bipartisan, you're too... right? Like, like so. And and I think another interesting little encapsulation of that is one of the eleven that voted, you know, to to allow the motion to vacate to come to a vote was the guy that's in Boehner's seat. I'm blanking on his name right now. Davidson, Warren, yeah, Warren, yeah Davidson. And I think that's also telling, right? It's like Boehner, you know, who was pushed out for also being too bipartisan, third straight speaker to be pushed out for being too bipartisan. Um, you know, the guy that replaced him in his district in Ohio is now like, no, I'm going to push out Kevin McCarthy, who's even, you know, more hardline than you, um, you know, for not doing the job. Good Lord. Uh, I did think that you, when you were doing history, you were going to do my my tuberculosis thing that I added to the discourse. Did you see this today, JVL? I didn't. Please. I felt, please I felt like I share. added a key. I felt like I added a pretty key piece of information to the discourse. I don't know if people are going to be able to see this. We're going to pull up. Can we see that? Oh, yeah. There he is. Oh, yeah. Michael uh, Crawford uh, Kerr. Who's that? Yeah. Michael Crawford Kerr. He's the last speaker to not survive a year. Uh, he was uh, uh, from 1875 to 1876. Um, he was pushed out, though, not because his colleagues found him to be a lying creep. He was pushed out because of tuberculosis, unfortunately. So he's like the William piece. Henry Harrison of Congress. Yeah, I do think he was a slaver, though. So, you know, we don't have to we don't have to honor. Him. But that's it, Kevin. That guy. Kevin, that guy. I'm shocked. Show us the picture again. I, yeah, I know. Well, Kevin a has slaver. I don't believe I don't that. Know. Right now, he kind of looks like he should be like bartending at a. At kind of like a one of those cocktail hipster cocktail bars that they got. No, he looks like Brandon Marsh of the Phillies. Uh, all right, so I think we've done it all. I I will just sort of say again, if any of these things had happened to the Democrats, then like we would not be able to hear the end of like Democrats in disarray, can't possibly vote for Biden. And just like with Trump calling on like you know, hey, maybe we should kill the generals. Uh, this just gets baked into the cake as, well, this is just what the Republicans are, right? You know, it's it's all, it's up to everybody else to be the grownups. This is what that party is. And, uh, you know, so if, if Joe Biden isn't absolutely perfect and the price of every single thing in the grocery store, every single SKU at your shop right has to be cheaper than it was in, in 2021, Otherwise, you can't vote for Joe Biden again. Can we um, can we actually end with what Mona Sharon, our colleague Mona Sharon, put in the Slack? Yes. She, this was, it was such a good Slack. Mona wrote uh, today, so many firsts. First time since 1860 that we didn't have a peaceful transfer of power. First time a president was impeached twice. First time a former president indicted. First time a speaker has been removed. These aren't mark your calendar events. They are evidence of instability and decline. I think that's about right. I think that's a nice way to True sum words. up. words. Never said. Uh, Joe, Tim, get worse, thanks though. for coming out for this. Oh, We're and, still declining. And don't worry, everyone. Yeah. We're There's a lot more worse. happening in the coming weeks. Get excited. Uh, listen, hit the subscribe button. Subscribe to, to the YouTube channel. And if you're not, for some reason, getting all the great stuff from the Bulwark that we give away for free every single day, uh, which is crazy, go over to thebulwark.com and sign up. Get Charlie's newsletter in the morning. Jim Swift's newsletter in the afternoon. Fantastic pieces. Joe Perdicon twice a week, sometimes more when Congress is exploding. Uh, we do all of these things for you, the people. 